Thank you. Um, first of all, I guess this, uh, this presentation of Claire Harding's the lead author and she can't make it today, so I'm helping her out by, by filling in and uh, apologies for that. But um, the other person in this uh, presenting or part of this work was Roger Cranswick as well, so I'm not sure if Roger's in here today, but um, my talk or the talk will be about mining national data sets for local scale NRM. Uh, and it, I guess it refers to the data cube which Matt was talking about before as well. But more so using water observations from space to provide remote monitoring of water levels in the southeast wetlands. So what is a problem? I guess uh, for everyone that wants to try and model or predict what's going to happen with surface water hydrology and wetlands over time, we need data. We haven't got it. Uh, we've got 16 or 17,000 wetlands in the southeast and only since 2009 have we only got about 15 in situ data loggers. And that's mainly due to expense and also maintenance and other factors. So there's a hell of a lot of coverage of wetlands out there which we don't know what's happening in terms of surface water hydrology. And when we want to look at vulnerabilities for climate change and so forth, we need that data. So there's a bit of a conundrum there. I mean, we can, we can always say we should have, should have done this in hindsight. Uh, and Claire would like me now to just wave my hands around the air and throw our chocolates to the crowd and say, well, there is a solution. Um, that solution being water observations from space. And that's produced by Geoscience Australia, and that was done to try and promote flood information out to the wider community. That was released in 2014 and includes every Landsat image uh, from Lands or sensors five, seven, and eight from 2000 or from 1986 to 2000, late 2017. So there's a hell of a lot of data there. There's over two, 200,000 images, and they've got a snazzy little algorithm which goes through and classifies each pixel uh, as either having uh, water presence or no water presence, or it's been impacted by cloud or shadow. So people like Dorothy and Claire had the foresight to envisage that we could use this in our wetland monitoring for the southeast. But I guess there's a problem. We've got, uh, for the southeast alone, there's something like 200,000 rasters over that, you know, for a, tic for a particular area. Um, so there's a bit of processing work to do there. So this is just an example of how we can, it's just an example of a stack of rasters. Uh, the blue represents the WASH data overlaid on aerial photo, and for the southeast it's over 200,000, like I said, from 1986 to the present, and each pixel in that image has been classified as having water present or not present. So then we overlay that with a LIDAR, we've got a fairly uh, good resolution DEM for the whole southeast, uh, and then we can attribute each pixel with the elevation value, so we can determine maximum water elevations over time. So the, the I guess the GIS speak, we, uh, Geoscience Australia put all this data out into um, Amazon Web Services and we can access that data using an S3 client like CyberDuck. So we can go in there, drag all the information down, we can then clip all those rasters to particular wetland boundaries, uh, we can pull out the DEM values to individual points and then we can use things like Python and so forth to attribute each point with every, with every um, pixel value for each date. And then we can export that out to Excel. It's a bit clumsy, the Excel bit. But that, at that stage, we can retrieve maximum wet elevations or if it's been dry. So then we can, this is an example of, we have got, this is one site where we've got some monitoring data from 2009 till now. But then we can go back for all the WASP data back to 1986. And for that particular site, it, trends, it correlates fairly well, especially the seasonal maximums. And when we have got that data, we can then do corrections. And in the southeast in particular, from 1987 to 2018, we've got an average 200, or 200, between 250 and 300 uh, clear observations. And in particular, we can get the maximum spring highs, or maximum spring elevations uh, in 93% of the years. And we can get the spring uh, autumn low or the wetland low 100% uh, of the time. So this particular slide just wants to illustrate we've replicated this across the southeast at a range of different sites. Uh, it does work well and we can use this for things like trend reporting, baseline reporting and also to develop baselines for 
uh, environmental water requirements for wetlands. There are a few limitations in that, uh, as Claire says there, vegetation affects the uh, absorption, uh, which would otherwise, the water would absorb the, um, re like the reflectance. So vegetation does pose a problem, uh, so it's largely been, been applied to cleared agricultural land, uh, wetlands. There are false positives in areas of cloud and terrain, and there are discrepancies in pixel sizes between, like we use a two metre dam versus a 25 metre Landsat pixel and also production time. Just finishing off, have I got? Uh, I guess traditionally we use it to look at surface water groundwater interactions for groundwater dependent ecosystems. But more importantly now we can use that to also look at changes in surface water hydro hydrology in terms of water depth and also frequency of inundation over time for epochs. But we can also use modeling to look at the vulnerability, vulnerability components. So finishing off, acknowledgements, uh, Geoscience Australia, Jen Schilling and Mark from the South East for allowing us to do this work. Uh, and there's also a paper coming out which is um, being peer reviewed at present. So thank you.